Okay, welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to start working on the classification system and the Six Kingdom concept. So um, this is kind of a general overview and we will go more in depth into the kingdoms. Um, and when we finally get to the animal and plant kingdoms, we'll go really in depth on those. So let's go ahead and begin. So Aristotle believed that all things found in nature existed on a ladder called the Scala Naturae. The idea still persists today in the concept of higher or lower order organisms, which is frankly silly. Aristotle displayed his own preference on the scale by stating that human women were below worms on the ladder of life. Um, but, you know, then again, he was Greek and they did have other interests. Aristotle's classification schemes were based on the 20 questions version of nature, or at least that's what I call it. So is it a plant or an animal? If it's an animal, does it fly, crawl, or swim? And he used simple classifications and common names, which led to a lot of confusion. In the Renaissance, scholars decided to get all scientific-y and muddy the waters a lot. They started to examine relationships between organisms and tried to reflect that in the names that they gave to them. So they used Latin or Greek names for the organisms to remove confusion with common names that differ from region to region, and that's something that we still do today. They also made a polynomial system of ten, over 10 words to describe an organism, but still didn't accurately group organisms. So introducing Carl von Linné, which is um, commonly known as Carolus Linnaeus, that's how he Latinized his name. And Linnaeus described organisms with two word names rather than polynomials. His Systema Notore was the first attempt at classifying all known organisms using a standardized set of naming rules. He created much less confusion and made it much easier for scientists from different countries to communicate about the same organism. So he developed the concept of the binomial nomenclature and the first word is the genus and the second word is the species and when you put them together you have the scientific name. So remember that when you write a scientific name, you write the capitalized first letter for the genus and a lowercase first letter for the species name. And that's always it. So um, humans, these are all names that you need to know. So humans is homo sapiens, cat, uh, cats are felis catus or felis domesticus, depending on who you ask. Wolves are canis lupus, dogs are canis lupus familiaris. So make sure you understand that dogs and wolves are the same species but dogs are a subspecies of that group. So um, they can interbreed just fine and produce viable offspring. Grizzly bears are Ursus arctos. Polars are Ursus maritimus because they swim in the ocean. Black bears are Ursus americanus, even though they exist in other countries as well. And chimpanzees are Pan troglodytes. The taxonomic hierarchy names organisms and identifies their relationships to each other from the very broad to the very specific. So all organisms are classified in this hierarchy, even us. So they go from the broadest, which is the domain, to the most specific, which is the species. And so you can see this is, this is uh, going from most specific to least specific in this particular picture. So the easiest way to remember domain to species brought us to most specific is a mnemonic saying dumb kids playing catch on freeways get squashed. So that's an easy way to remember the domain kingdom phylum class order family genus species. So take a moment to look up the complete taxonomic hierarchy for a human being from domain to species. And I want you to take that time and actually write it down. And if you would like to check and make sure that you're on the right track, feel free to contact me either by email or over office hours. And I'll be happy to go over that with you. So this guy, Ernst Meyer, in 1924, defined a species as in the currently recognized language. And he called it the biological species concept. And he said, a species is a group of actually or potentially breeding natural groups that are reproductively isolated from other groups. There's two problems with the biological species concept, though. Um, because when you have two different species, they can produce hybrids, which are sterile offspring produced by these two different species. But it also has problems with asexual organisms as well as bacterial translocation because that can go over cross-species and even cross-genera. 
Um, so that means that they can really go and have some funky fun. So the question is, how many species are there on the planet? And scientists currently estimate that there are over 10 million plus species worldwide, and over 5 million of these live in the tropics alone. Most of the unnamed species are either very small or microscopic, although occasionally we do have big ones that show up. So taxonomy helps to prevent confusion among scientists. It helps to show how organisms are also related, and they can help use to help reconstruct phylogenies, which are the evolutionary histories of an organism or a group. Okay, so let's take a look at our categories, and we'll start with the three, three domains. Archaea are generally small unicellular bacteria that lack a protein complex called peptidoglycan in their cell walls, and these are the ancient life forms. We, we suspect that they reflect a lot of the characteristics that organisms that first developed on this planet have. The bacteria, or eubacteria, they kind of use it interchangeably, the bacteria include the modern bacteria and are generally unicellular and do contain peptidoglycan in their cell walls. And then the eukaryota include all the organisms, unicellular or multicellular, that have a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles in their cells. Within these three domains are the six kingdoms. The six kingdoms classification system has been in place since 1977. And remember, Monera, which was bacteria and archaeobacteria, aren't together anymore, and they haven't been since 1968. So um, this has been around for quite a while, so it shouldn't take you too long to adjust to it since it's older than you are and almost older than I am. The archaeobacteria we're going to start off with and some of the characteristics, and you do need to know these, so write them down, are that they are unicellular, they live in extreme environments, they're prokaryotic, they don't have any peptidoglycan in their cells, and some examples include methanogens, halophiles, and thermophiles. Eubacteria are unicellular, prokaryotic, they're considered the common bacteria, they have peptidoglycan in their cell walls, and some examples include Streptococcus, E. coli, Staphylococcus, and Shigella. The Protista are eukaryotic. They're unicellular or multicellular, and they have lots of different lifestyles. Some examples include diatoms, euglena, amoeba, slime molds, and paramecium. The fungi are eukaryotic, usually multicellular. They have cell walls made of chitin, and they are external heterotrophs. I'll explain that later in the, in the fungi lecture. These include yeasts, mildews, mushrooms, and puffballs. The plantae are characterized by being multicellular, eukaryotic, have cell walls with cellulose in them, and are autotrophic. Some examples of these include mosses, ferns, flowering plants, and trees. And finally, we come to the animalia. Animalia are characterized by being multicellular, eukaryotic. They don't have cell walls, except for one. <laughs> and they're also internal heterotrophs. Some examples of these include the insects, mammals, birds, and worms. Okay, so that's a brief overview of the different kingdoms and domains. We're going to look at the individual kingdoms individually, thus the name, um, when we get to the next set series of lectures. So you guys have a great day.